We'll continue with our study of waves in this next chapter. Sound. Remember, it's all in the chapter notes here. What is sound? You've heard this one before, I'm sure. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it still make a sound? Well, I think a lot of people would say, yeah, sure it does. But actually, it's making a vibration. It's not really sound until it's perceived by somebody who hears it. At least that's what the dictionary might say. Here we have a rather crude diagram of the ear. The vibrations in air approach the outer ear. This acts like a funnel concentrating the energy into the ear canal. The vibrations hit the eardrum causing it to move back and forth. The eardrum moves the hammer, anvil, and the stirrup, those three little bones in the middle ear. They move back and forth and press against the fluid-filled cochlea. This is where the nerve endings lie. This is in the inner ear. The fluid allows the nerve endings, which are like little cilia, and they wiggle when the vibrations pass them. And the longer ones vibrate at the low frequencies, the shorter ones vibrate at the high frequencies, and they send a little nerve impulse, which gets gathered out and carried to the brain by the auditory nerve. Down here, we have the eustachian tube, which connects the middle ear to your throat. There's air out here, and there's air in the middle ear as well on both sides of the eardrum. The eustachian tube is normally closed. But when you swallow, it opens up and it allows the air pressure to equalize. So imagine you're driving in your car going up a big hill and your ear starts to get stuffy. Why? The air pressure on the outside is dropping. The air inside here is still at the normal pressure and it's pushing outward on your eardrum, preventing it from moving back and forth freely. So then you swallow. The, the eustachian tube opens up and the air pressure equalizes and you hear a pop. That's your ears popping. Well, we can demonstrate that these nerve endings actually pick up the sound by putting a tuning fork to your head. At school, I take the tuning fork, strike it, put it to your head, and you put your fingers in your ears. You'll hear the sound inside your head. What's going on is that the sound isn't coming through your ear, it's going right through your skull and vibrating the nerve endings directly. This is actually a test to see if your nerve endings are functional by putting a tuning fork right behind your ear. If the nerve endings are functional, you'll hear the sound. But maybe you can't hear through your ear very well. Well, maybe you've got a problem in the outer ear. Maybe you have a problem in the ear canal. Maybe you have one in the middle ear. You can get an infection. Have a you can have a throat infection. Gets the middle ear infected. The pus builds up. The air can't equalize. You can have a condition where blood and pus build up inside here, and you have to go in here with a sterile needle and pop that and have all the blood and pus shoot out, and then you can hear again. Well, you don't really need a tuning fork. You can just put your fingers in your ears and start talking, and you're going to hear yourself loud and clear. How come? Because the, because the vibrations in your throat are traveling right through your bones and your skull and going into that inner ear to make the cilia move. You can feel the vibrations when you talk by putting your hand on your throat and you talk, you'll feel those vibrations. So how come you sound so different when you listen to your voice on a recording? Well, when you listen to your voice on a recording, not only is the sound coming out through your mouth and going into your ear through the air, it's also vibrating through your skull and vibrating the cochlea, which makes the nerve endings move directly. So you have two different qualities of sound. When you play the recording back, everybody says, you sound normal. That's the way you always sound. Well, that's because that's all they ever hear. They're not hearing the sound of your own voice in their head. When I clap my hands, I make a sound. What did I just do to the air? I compressed it. And it sends the energy out in the form of a compressional wave. Well, air is the medium. And if I strike the tuning fork, I can make a continuous sound. What's happening to the air? Just looking at one tine on the tuning fork, we can see that it's moving back and forth very quickly. This motion pushes against the air molecules, creating at some places higher pressure, lower pressure than normal air pressure. And these waves of compression move outward. 
we're going to make a graph of displacement of the tip of the tuning fork versus time. This is the equilibrium position. This will be all the way forward. This will be all the way back. We're going to start at the equilibrium position going forward. It's simple harmonic motion. We go forward, back to the equilibrium, all the way back, back to the equilibrium, and it's just a sine curve. Do you think you could sketch a velocity graph that corresponds with a displacement graph? You want to look at the slope, don't you? The slope is high at the origin. That's where we have a high velocity. When we reach the maximum displacement, the slope is zero, we have zero velocity. That just means that the tuning fork is moved all the way forward. It has to stop before it starts to come back. When it gets back to the equilibrium position, it's going backwards at a high speed. How fast is it going when it gets all the way back? It has no velocity. The slope is zero. And back at the equilibrium position, it has a high velocity. It's on its way back, passing through the middle. Yeah, we get the cosine curve. Well, what's all this have to do with these molecules? Well, right here, we can see that the molecules are close together. This is high pressure. The molecules are spaced out far. That's low pressure. So looking at these graphs, can you tell what creates the high pressure? Is it the distance we've traveled or is it the velocity? Well, the maximum velocity looks like it corresponds with high pressure. Same over here, high pressure. And same over here, high pressure. What's happening when we're going backwards at the highest rate of speed? We're at the low pressure. Same here, we're at the low pressure. Remember this now, speed causes the compressions and rarefactions. The compressions are high pressure. The low pressure is what we call the rarefactions, where the molecules are furthest apart. If I push my hand forward, the air just moves around and comes on the other side. It's not like a bicycle pump where I can compress the air slowly and the air can't go anywhere and it gets compressed. The air is open and free to move, so the only way to get the molecules compressed is to go quickly to send that shock wave through the air. So if it's the speed that compresses the air, we can just call this a pressure graph. This is above normal air pressure. This is below normal air pressure. And that isn't zero pressure, it's normal air pressure. This is the measure of pressure above and below normal air pressure. I strike the tuning fork and then I dip it in the water. The tips of the tuning fork have to be moving very quickly in order for this thing to shoot the water all over the place. You can't really see them moving very well. But at school we have a strobe light that we can use to stop the action and see it move slowly. So when I strike the tuning fork, the tuning fork has to push against the air. And you can hear that. But what if I hold the tuning fork against the board? Can you hear it get louder? Why does it get louder? The vibrations of the board are much more efficient at pushing against the air. We have more surface area. Well, we can have some better control with all of this with a loudspeaker connected to a frequency generator. The electrical signal produced by the frequency generator goes into an electromagnet behind the speaker, causing this speaker to move back and forth, creating those pressure waves. I can change the frequency, creating a higher pitch. I can lower the frequency all the way down until we don't hear it. The speaker is now moving so slow, it's not really compressing the air. Now I can change the amplitude. I can raise the amplitude. So I've got the speaker on its side now. I'm gonna put a little styrofoam in here and we can see it moving up and down and I'm gonna increase the frequency. Right now, we're listening to about 130 cycles per second. The range of our hearing should be as low as 20, but this speaker is not capable of producing that low frequency. 
and we can hear say that's 200 that's 2000 and now that's 20,000 I'm going down to 17,000 15,000 now in the classroom, some kids can actually hear the sound right about now at about 14,000. My hearing, I'm a little old, so I don't really hear those high frequencies. Okay, I'm picking it up now, right there, real sharp and clear. I hear 12,000 hertz. We can visualize all this on the oscilloscope. I can change the amplitude. I can change the frequency. I can even move the speaker and use it to generate electricity that can be registered on the oscilloscope. It can pick up my voice. Hello, hello, that's like a microphone. Now, if I speak into the microphone, you can see all the wave patterns that are forming qu so quickly. It is just hard to believe that the computers can digest this, somehow break it down and form speech recognition out of this, but that's what they do. Humans have a hard time understanding speech themselves. For example, if I say sweet, you can see this is high frequency. The E is a lower frequency. And we have to break these frequencies down to understand speech. The older we get, the shorter nerve endings in our cochlea can die out, and then we have a harder time understanding higher frequency sounds. So if I say to my father-in-law, nice feet, he might say, what's sweet? Because we don't understand the difference between the high frequencies so easily. So is sound a mechanical or a non-mechanical wave? We have a little experiment at school to prove this. I have a bell jar hooked up to a valve going to a vacuum pump. Inside, I've put a bell, an electrical bell, connected through a rubber stopper over to a power supply. Now, we can pump out all the air and listen to the bell go off, let the air back in. You gotta make sure you shut the valve again so it's the same before and after. It's a lot quieter with the air pumped out. Now, we don't get a perfect vacuum here by any means, but it's quieter. When you let the air back in, you can hear it get louder again. So what's that tell us? Yeah, it's mechanical. You need air to carry the sound. But what else does this demonstrate? Think about it. When the air is all pumped out, can you still see the bell inside? Ah, yeah. What's that tell us about light? It's not any darker at all. Light is non-mechanical. We can see it without the air in there. So just how fast is the tip of the tuning fork moving? This one has a frequency of 320 hertz. It might be hard to tell, but we have an amplitude of about half a centimeter. It's all simple harmonic motion. You might remember that the maximum velocity occurs at the equilibrium position in simple harmonic motion. And it can be found from taking the angular velocity times the radius, which is the amplitude of the motion. Remember, it's all based on a component of circular motion. Do you remember that omega is two pi over the period? The radius is the amplitude. One over the period is frequency. So if I plug in two pi, 320 hertz, and a half a centimeter for an amplitude, Wow, that's 1,005 centimeters per second. That's about 10 meters per second. Obviously, as the amplitude dies down, that number is going to be a little smaller. It sure is interesting to think that this is moving on the order of meters per second. Now, if you listen closely, you can actually hear a low pitch and a high pitch. What's going on? It's tuning fork harmonics. Each tine of the tuning fork vibrates with one end fixed and one end free. So in the fundamental mode of vibration, 
the tuning fork is moving back and forth on each side with a quarter of a standing wave. But while it's doing this, it can also have another mode of vibration, the third harmonic. And there could be a node here. We have a half a wave and a quarter of a wave. We have three quarters of a wave standing. This end is free, that end is fixed. Now you can hear that higher pitch when I strike it on a hard surface. So if this is 320 hertz, what's that frequency? It's 960, it's three times that. Well, that's it for this intro. The next thing we're gonna do is a lab on the speed of sound and it's on video. Please do the worksheet.